For people with disabilities, marriage is often costly, complicated, and financially impossible. The government forced us to make a decision between survival and marriage. A maze of bureaucratic restrictions keep many couples with disabilities from turning love into marriage. I feel that Social Security is practicing a form of genocide. Anybody that's able-bodied is not forced to live under the same constrictions that someone with a disability is forced to live under. And if it were an able-bodied person, they wouldn't stand for it. Disabled and the cost of saying, I do, next on Life and Times. Major funding for Life and Times is provided by the James Irvine Foundation, which is dedicated to the development of an informed California citizenry, with additional support from GTE, a company committed to telecommunications excellence and an open dialogue among all people. Hello, I'm Val Zavala. It's an option in life that most of us take for granted. We meet someone, fall in love, and if we want, we get married. But if you're disabled and receiving government help, that is not a viable option. The reason? Getting married means losing crucial Social Security benefits and facing financial ruin. Social Security is more than just retirement income for Americans. It was designed from the beginning to help the disabled. The assumption being that society has a responsibility to help those who, through no fault of their own, cannot support themselves. In fact, most people with disabilities would love to be independent, to work, and if they choose, to marry and start a family. But as long as government regulations are what they are, these basic desires will go unfulfilled. My expectations were that of everyone else. Being able to work and sharing my life with someone, eventually getting married, yeah, having a very normal normal life filled with things that are important to everyone work and marriage a family I was born um, in the Philippines and I contracted polio when I was a year and a half and I lived there for 10 years and then my family moved over here I attended high school here and I received my AA degree and then my Bachelor of Arts degree Albert and I started dating um, our first year in college and uh, we dated all through college um, and it was after we graduated that we decided to get married. She's a very beautiful woman. I am um, having the thing that caught my eyes were her eyes, her personality. You saw everything through her eyes and you understood right then and there. It's not that hard not to fall in love with her. Sounds like a beautiful love story. A couple meets, falls in love, decides to get married. But both Bernadette and Albert have disabilities and are forced to rely on government programs for vital support. Their simple desire for marriage resulted in an unfortunate odyssey common to disabled people who want to marry and work like any other American. Helping us understand the complex government regulations is Marta Russell. She is a disability advocate and a member of the Los Angeles County Commission on Disabilities. She introduced us to Albert and Bernadette. I interviewed Albert at his favorite cafe in Pomona and visited Bernadette in her apartment at Access Village, a subsidized housing project for people with disabilities. Uh, we had a, a traditional uh, Catholic wedding. This is my sister and Albert's best friend. And this is our wedding picture. We had a fairly big wedding, seven bridesmaids and seven grooms, and our families were very excited about you know, our commitment. I think when you make a commitment to get married, that it is forever. It's, that's what marriage is about. What happened right after you got married? A week after 
we came back from our honeymoon and we called Social Security to tell them that we had gotten married. Uh, the Social Security Administration had sent us a letter and in it, um, and I, I will probably never forget it, but it, in it that they had said that our marriage was uh, a terminating event and that um, that was reason enough to terminate his benefits. I was devastated. Uh, I felt like, how could this happen? This is terribly wrong, and we began to appeal our decision right away, their decision right away. Their case became local news. Albert and Bernadette were caught in a technicality in Social Security policy. Albert was receiving disability insurance. It came through Social Security. He qualified because his father had paid into Social Security like most Americans do all their working lives. Unfortunately, the simple act of marriage terminated him from this valuable benefit. Albert had tried to find out in advance what effect his marriage would have on his benefits, but he got wrong information, and he ended up not only losing his disability insurance, but more importantly, for a person with cerebral palsy, he lost his Medicare. It felt like someone had taken a knife and um, really just stabbed me in, in the back. Uh, I felt the government had not allowed for this type of situation to occur. When we were faced with these marriage penalties, um, we were we were angry we were we couldn't believe that this was happening um, we started reaching out to people in the community uh, congressman dreyer introduced a bill in congress that would eliminate this marriage incentive but unfortunately it, it failed we also fought this marriage disincentive issue through the court system and we Wanted, wanted to take it as far as the Supreme Court, but we financially um, couldn't go that far. Now both Bernadette and Albert were living on Supplemental Security Income, known as SSI. SSI is the primary federal aid program for the disabled when they have no other means of support. It's administered through the Social Security Administration. Albert and Bernadette lost their case at the appeals court, but we're left with more questions than answers from Social Security. We were given misinformation and it turned everything, our lives, upside down to try and figure out what to do. You know, since we got over one lie, we were working, we, you know, we had to deal with another, like one after another. Um, it was just a constant struggle, what was true and what wasn't true, with their laws. To understand the consequences of the law, Marta went to Elena Ackle, a legal aid attorney who specializes in SSI. The tragedy is he's lost a good benefit that his father worked for all his life by getting married. He didn't know in advance, and once he got married, it could never be undone. He's lost it for the rest of his life. You got a hug for me today? Hey, I love children. I love children. And that's all I've ever really wanted to do. To be a teacher, I always wanted to be a mother. I thought that uh, eventually I would marry and have a family and live on my own. There was no question. Donna has cerebral palsy. Like four and a half million disabled Americans, Donna's only source of support is SSI. As a California resident, she receives the maximum benefit, $603.40 a month. She also receives Medi-Cal. Donna is in her last year of college, working towards her dream, a teaching job, and a way off of SSI. Bill and I met back in 82. Um, he was working at the school that I was volunteering at. We were just friends. We worked with uh, disabled children, and we'd see each other on breaks and just, hi, how's it going? We decided to get married because we love each other and the fact that we really enjoyed each other's company. We wanted a church wedding. That's what we really wanted. I mean, we had lots of friends and family, and 
you know, it was something that we believe is a forever commitment. Their marriage plans were accelerated when Donna found out she was pregnant. What did I feel when I found out I was going to be a father? Surprise. Most definite surprise. I'd received radiation treatment back in 1973 for Hodgkin's disease, and from that I was told I was sterile. Lo and behold, I found that I'm not so after all, after all these years. As the couple started making their marriage plans, they were stopped in their tracks by a Social Security policy called deeming. That means if she married Bill, his income and assets would be deemed hers, and that could reduce her SSI benefits or bump her off SSI completely. I started looking into how much SSI I would lose um, should I get married. And I called, and I called anonymously because I didn't want to give my name. Um, but I wanted to know, you know, how much of an income would my spouse, i.e. Bill, have to have before I would lose um, any money. No one would give me a direct answer. But all they could tell me is that I would lose money. Since Donna could not get a clear answer, Marta called Social Security herself and asked what SSI benefits Donna would lose if she had a husband earning $1,500 a month. I called Social Security three times. The first time, they told me her benefit would be reduced 80% down to $123 a month. The second time, they told me she would be ineligible for any benefits at all. The third time I called, they said that she would receive only $93 a month. So I decided to go down to the local Social Security office myself and meet with someone in person. I met with Ed Shanahan. In the case where someone is receiving $1,500 and they're married to someone who's on SSI as a disabled individual, we'd reduce their benefits down to $157.40. That would be her SSI check each month. But Ed Shanahan's answer was different from the other three answers I had been given before. How do we explain these discrepancies? You know, I really, I don't really have a ready explanation for the, I mean I could see if they were off by a couple of cents, but we cover the, the range from no entitlement at all to, to $100. $23. It's not a, that difficult a computation because it's on our computer system. We, we would just plug in the, the information you've just given me, $1,500 in gross wages, the individual um, on SSI in the state of California, and, and the answer should be there. It should be consistent no matter how many calls you make to the, to the, uh, the 800 number or to the local Social Security office. Social Security is a chronic purveyor of misinformation. That's why when people want to know what will happen if they do certain things, they can't get an answer about Social Security they can rely on because they'll call three different people, and if they get an answer at all, it will be three different answers, and most often, all of them will be wrong. Even if you get information and you rely on it to your own detriment, there's no accountability. That's right. I mean, it, if, if that was the wrong information and you relied on their information, and that you've acted in a way that makes you ineligible, you're ineligible, you lose out. Simply the fact that they got misinformation, although very unfortunate, wouldn't allow us to continue benefits to her. With no recourse, Donna could not afford to lose her SSI. I get $603.40 a month and Medi-Cal. House goes for rent, about $20 a week for food. Uh, it varies per week, but gas for my car, uh, clothing should I need any, personal items, utilities, phone, which is a necessity for me because I am asthmatic. I have to be able to call for help. You really can't live on that money. I mean, you can if what you call what I do living. It's just basically existing. It's a hand-to-mouth existence. Even if Donna and Bill got married, Bill's income and assets would not help Donna get ahead. Instead, both Donna and Bill would be dragged into poverty. How so? Because SSI has a resource limit of $3,000 for each couple. This means Bill would have to voluntarily give up his savings and his car and keep his total assets under $3,000. If he didn't, Donna would be knocked off of SSI.
it would appear that one of the greatest disincentives to marry is the resource limit for persons who do marry on a, in one partners on SSI. Could you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, for one person on SSI, you can't have more than $2,000 in assets, and for a couple, it's 3000 Well, if you want, like, a normal marriage situation, you're supposed to be saving towards your retirement. You can't do that. So that means, you know, even if you stay married, the time you retire, you're going to be on SSI, too. And so there's, you can't do, like, the normal things of life of save up for a child's education. You can't do that because you'll be cut off. You can't save your retirement, you'll be cut off. You can't save for a down payment because you'll be cut off. If you save for anything, like any normal couple saves for, you'll be cut off. So it's totally unrealistic. They're, again, of forcing the person that is working every day to live like they're on welfare and like they're going to be on welfare the entire rest of their life until they die. Once married, Bill's assets, his 1987 Mazda, savings account, certificates of deposit, and life insurance policy would have resulted in Donna losing all her benefits, including her Medi-Cal. I advise everybody against getting married because, you know, once they've deemed if you have too much money and you don't get any SSI, then, more important, you don't get any Medi-Cal. And when you don't get any Medi-Cal, there's no way that the other spouse is going to be able to pay for their medical bills. So if you had decided to marry Bill, that would have put you at great risk in some ways. Yes, specifically medic medically. I would most likely have no health insurance at all. But in the case of his insurance, they say that if you have a pre-existing condition, that they won't insure that pre-existing condition for up to a year. But in my case, since, I seem, since they deem me to have more pre-existing conditions than um, they would cover, I most likely would not have anything at all, and that could uh, mean my life. So you really didn't have a choice. You couldn't get married. No, I couldn't get married. No matter how much I may want to, I still want to. For Albert and Bernadette, their second year of marriage was going well. Their failed court and congressional battles were behind them, and Albert was offered a job with the Department of Rehabilitation. Bernadette was offered a part-time job as a disability advocate. But before they accepted the jobs, they called Social Security to find out how their earnings would affect their benefits. And again, we got no answer. We couldn't get anywhere. Um, you know, Albert took the job, and then I was also offered a job. Um, we took them um, because we had worked most of our lives for, you know, our education and um, a lot of the work experience we had built up for was to, to to try and get to try and have a better better life to you know to keep working towards something better. A job to me means financial security, obviously, but it also means self self work and pride. And it, it really feels quite good to actually be productive. What Albert didn't realize was that by working, he would face the same $3,000 resource limit that prevented Donna and Bill from getting married. Bernadette's SSI, Medi-Cal, and personal attendant would be in jeopardy. I need um, a full-time attendant seven days a week. Um, because I'm severely disabled, and um, and I need help um, with everything from getting dressed, going to the bathroom, fixing my meals. My attendant is my hands and my feet to do just everything throughout my day. If I didn't have an attendant, I would be living in a convalescent hospital because I would have to have someone to take care of me. My attendant um, is my independence. Because of my pre-existing condition, I wouldn't have been able to get private insurance. And not only that, but the premiums would be so high if I were able to, to even get private insurance that I wouldn't be able to afford it. But it wouldn't have been able to also cover 
my, my wheelchair expenses. A power chair like what I've got or what I need is about $8,000 for a new, a new one. And, um, and the maintenance on it is about anywhere from 600 to 1000 a year. I just don't understand how anyone can even begin to imagine living up a $3,000 limit the rest of your life. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean a month, that doesn't mean a year. That means you live off $3,000. I just don't understand how the government, or in this case, Social Security expects anyone to get married and be expected to live off that. It's physically impossible to do so. Bernadette and Albert faced a terrible choice, a choice that only people on SSI are forced to make. We made the choice to get divorced. It would not only save us the grief or, I don't want to call it grief, the frustration of economic insolvency, which is basically what it is. Do you think that Social Security policy contributed to your divorce? I feel that Social Security is practicing a form of genocide. And by that I mean not allowing people with disabilities to get married the government forced us to get a divorce. Um, the government forced us to make a decision between survival and marriage. For Donna and Bill, who are now parents, Social Security policies are keeping them from getting married, a situation that runs contrary to their values and beliefs. I don't feel that I'm really welcome in any church that I go to attend because when they find out about my living situation, um, you know, because I do live with a roommate, um, and they find out about the fact that my child was conceived out of wedlock and that Bill and I are, are engaged. It doesn't matter that we're on our way to becoming a married couple. What matters is the fact that we are not married and we have conceived a child out of wedlock. But yet we try to attend church like an, uh, an quote, normal family would. There is a double standard. You know, here, you know, we're being told, gee, you can work, and gee, yeah, you can get married, and, and, and all of this. But then we're being penalized for it. You know, no one else in society, when I'm talking about no one else, anyone, anybody that's able-bodied is not forced to live under the same constrictions that someone with a disability is forced to live under. And if it were an able-bodied person, they wouldn't stand for it. They'd say it was discriminatory. It was against their civil rights. Well, my civil rights are being violated every day, and I'm forced to live with it. Well, I'm tired of it. But how can such an obvious unfairness persist? Marta Russell tried to talk directly to high-ranking government officials. I tried repeatedly to get an interview with the Commissioner of Social Security and the Secretary of Health and Human Services but my repeated requests for interviews were denied. In my research, I found that solutions, in fact, have been proposed. Back in 1992, Social Security commissioned a report, the SSI Modernization Project Report, and in that report, some very good recommendations were made. One, to increase the $3,000 resource limit that would help meet today's financial realities. And as well, I discovered that there are bills pending in Congress which would help to reform these outdated and unjust laws, but more bills need to be proposed. But today, nothing has happened. Whatever the reason, it's clear that reform of the SSI program will be very difficult. Still, Bernadette is not giving up. My expectations uh, for the future is to try and, and work with people with disabilities to try and change the laws and, and to make our issues heard 
to the people in Washington and people in the Social Security, Social Security Administration, you know, to to work with them and to make it so that we can work and we can get married um, and to have a normal life, to have all those things that people take for granted that we should be entitled to. By taking SSI, people think that's all we're good for, that we're a drain on the system. I'm not a drain on the system. I want to contribute to the system that has helped me, but I'm not being allowed to. And if I marry, then my chances to contribute to the system that has helped me go out the window. If you're disabled in this country and you decide to marry another person with a disability, please don't. I don't want anyone to go through what we had to go through. It's, it's a very frustrating, very tiring process. And in the long run, you're going to end up separated anyway. Love, love conquers a great deal of things. But the government, or this particular branch of the government, destroys so much more. Disabled advocates say change will be difficult. First, most disabled who receive government aid are poor and unable to lobby for their rights. Second, reforms for the disabled are overshadowed by other social security and health care issues. There are several ways policy can be changed. Congress can amend the laws. Health and Human Services, the parent agency of social security, could change the regulations. Or the White House could make reforms for the disabled a priority. We'd like to know your response to this program. Please send your comments to Life and Times, 4401 Sunset Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90027, or call 213-664-4159. Major funding for Life and Times was provided by the James Irvine Foundation, which is dedicated to the development of an informed California citizen. With additional support from GTE, building better communities through communication.